Hello, everybody. I'm Casey, and I made Isolde say a tongue twister on stage, so you're welcome for that already. Now, uh, we're going to be talking about mirrors, and so it makes sense to start with one of the most famous mirrored halls in all the world. You probably, as smart folks, recognize this spectacle, the Hall of Mirrors of the Palace of Versailles. It was built in 18, excuse me, 1684, and that's the only bit of detail I'm going to tell about you, because somebody else can tell you all the historic things that have happened in this room. I'm here to tell you about how its mere existence was one of the biggest fuck yous in the entire century that it was built. And we're going to get into this starting with a little bit of context. So back in this period of time, mirrors were one of the most expensive and luxurious pieces of personal belongings that existed at the time. And there was one guild in one place in the Venetian Republic that held the secret of how these mirrors were made and made so well. And yeah, <laughs> luxury, you take your pick. Uh, but when I say they held this monopoly, I mean they held this monopoly. Uh, since the 1300s, they had forced all glassmaking in Venice to happen offshore on this set of islands called Murano. And that was probably a pretty good idea because most of Venice was made out of wood and making glass involved lots of fire and furnaces. And so there were some wise city planners who made this choice. But it also came out with this um, bonus, which is that all of your glass makers, these experts in the field, uh, have to live on this island with their equipment and their secrets, basically imprisoned for all time. And these men were taught their trade after they had been sworn to secrecy forever. <laughs> And once they were taught this trade, they had to live on the island. They weren't allowed to correspond or speak or visit with any foreigners. And if they had a trip that they needed to take, they needed to have it okayed by the government. And then the government would probably hold their family hostage until they came back so that they wouldn't be tempted to share the secrets of mirror making with anybody else and start up a compound somewhere else. And the people responsible for this secret keeping were called the Council of Ten. They'd been around since the 1310, so they had a lot of practice in this secret police business. I like to call them the Mad Murano Mirror Mob because basically <laughs> they were trouble. Uh, they had 200 years of expertise and experience in espionage and counter-espionage and in enforcing their own policing system. And the government had said, yeah, cool, go do that thing. Keep an eye out for all of the commerce that comes in and out of the busy port of Venice. So the Council of Ten did a great job with that and they kept an extra special eye on the mirror trade because starting in the 16th century, that mirror trade made Venice bank. They could charge so much for these newfangled mirrors that they had invented and put out in the world that uh, it was a significant portion of the wealth of Venice at that time. And so competitors near and far came and were like, hey, show us how it's done. And the Council of Ten was like, nope. And I'd like to take a moment to discuss what your other options were if you decided not to invest in a Venetian mirror. <laughs> For a really long time, it was this. <laughs> if you wanted to check out your hairdo or see if that toga made your butt look big, you had to go find a sunny day and a smooth, flat piece of water and try your luck. It was 6,000 years ago that mirrors started to be produced, mostly out of polished obsidian or polished metal, uh, but those pieces of technology only reflected about 20% of the light that came in. So again, sunny day, only daytime, they didn't travel well because they were fucking heavy, and they scratched really easily. So this was not an ideal solution. And it was the first century AD that the Lebanese and later the Romans decided the glass would be a clever way to improve on this. But it was not the breakthrough, pun intended, that we're looking for here. Oh. <laughs> because we um, really need a lot of improvements to come along before that breakthrough occurs. 
The mirrors back then, they were pretty flawed. We would look at them and see them as a funhouse style, subpar quality product. And part of that problem was that glass had not developed at that point. A lot of the glass, all the glass, was made out of impurities. A lot of them had iron, leading to a green tint and every mirror giving you a rather deathly pallor. The other problem was that we didn't know how to make flat glass yet. Yet. So you'd blow a round piece of glass and then you'd cut a piece of it and you'd get either a convex or a concave mirror, leading to a very important question, skinny mirror or fat mirror? <laughs> Those are your options. And there was another significant challenge to this because in order to get the glass that you'd blown to fuse to the background, you had to um, have master metalsmiths to create a piece of lead with the same shape of curve and then you'd put some hot metal backing in between to try to get the two to fuse and they would break pretty much every single time. So no matter how many materials and man hours and expertise you put into these, it almost always failed. So glass mirrors were really expensive and pretty shitty. We had 7,000 years of using shitty mirrors and had no idea that they got any better than this until 1373 when the first guild of mirror makers occurs in Nuremberg and they come up with the idea of putting the metal inside as you're blowing the glass so that saves some of the breakage but you still end up with these greenish curved dull mirrors. The breakthrough comes in Venice in 1507 with these Venetian mirrors, which are basically like the champagne of France. They come with a tagline of where they're produced because that is the only place you can get them and they are way better. Uh, they're also way more expensive. So there's this story of, um, in the late 17th century, a countess who is reported to trade an entire wheat field for a mirror thinking she got the better end of the bargain. Before I only had a yearly crop of wheat and a regular income supply, but now I have this gorgeous mirror. It's fabulous. The <laughs> price for one was generally on par with a fully equipped sailing ship. And these mirrors per square inch went for more than a painting from a popular high Renaissance painter like Raphael. And they were really only the size of a hand mirror. We didn't have the technology to make them um, more than about 40 square inches, even with these ex this expertise that had taken thousands of years to develop. Uh, so this tiny piece of reflective glass could be recognized on site. It was recognized as a luxury good, and it was the thing that you had that signified that you were the top of the top of wealthy. Basically, we can relate this to the modern day. Any trappings of luxury that we recognize, Gucci, Lamborghini, just replace that with a mirror and you'll start to realize the importance of holding these secrets close for Venice. And even though these high-class Venetian mirrors were generally limited to this tiny size, everybody wanted to have them, and so Venice could charge whatever they wanted and tell nobody how it was done. Till today, I'm gonna tell you, so if you do not know, wanna know these secrets, go ahead and plug your ears. The Council of Ten could be watching. Okay, so first, spend hundreds of years figuring out how to make clear glass. The secret, ladies and gentlemen, is to hand pick pebbles of quartz that have no veins in them, grind them up, and combine them with a secret potion of ash from a plant that only grows on the Levantine coast and you have a monopoly on collecting. Second, spend an equally long time developing a technique called the Latimo glass that makes glasses kind of milky and mimics the ceramics that were coming out of China that were so valued. And then add a little bit of that Latimo to your clear glass to give it a certain, certain something. The secret to that look, lead and tin. Third, invite 
um, invent the revolutionary technique for making flat glass. What you do is you blow a long cylinder, you cut off the ends, you slit it down the middle, you cool it down, and then you heat it back up, and you roll it out on a lead plate, and then you polish that sucker until it has no impurities and it's super smooth. Next, you gotta invite some more expertise into the mix. You get a master glazier to come and melt down some tin. And then you get another set of experts, some artisans who were only taught this technique after they have been sworn to super secrecy. They spread that tin out in a foil on a lipped um, kind of table made out of very smooth marble. And then you add mercury. The tin is gonna dissolve into the mercury and make an amalgam, and this is the mirror breakthrough, pun intended again, that we've been waiting for. Next, you add uh, another secret potion made up of tiny little pieces of gold and bronze, and that's gonna give your finished product a luminosity that nobody has been able to match. There's more, because then you lower your piece of super smooth glass onto this lipped marble smooth table with your tin, um, bronze, gold, and mercury amalgam in one smooth motion, making sure that you don't tear this very fragile foil. You add some weight so that you get a good contact. You then adjust your table to a slight incline, allowing any excess mercury to slide and pour off. Watch yourself, because mercury is an airborne poison <laughs> if you heat it at all, which you might if you're working in some warm place, like maybe a glass foundry. Then you take the next two weeks or maybe a month to daily tilt your mirror up a fraction of a little bit further so that you continue to coax excess mercury to either pour off or to evaporate again, making this airborne poison. After that month, once you have it totally vertical, you probably got rid of as much mercury as you can, so you put a nice varnish on the back, you trim the edges, you slap it into a gorgeous frame, and you sell it for a gazillion dollars. And that's it. Does it start to make sense now why that secret was worth keeping from prying eyes so carefully? And that this international mirror trade became a phenomenon that countries the world over wanted to get in on? And the job that the Council of Ten had to keep these glassmakers and their expertise so close? So it comes as quite a blow in 18, or excuse me, the 1680s that, um, Jean-Baptiste Colbert uh, shows up in Murano and he's interested in stealing all of this expertise. And because he is the minister of the Sun King, Louis XIV, he's got bags and bags of gold and he coaxes away three of these expert mirror makers to come to France because there is a law in France at the time that says that nothing that goes into the Palace of Versailles can be made outside of the country. The Palace of Versailles has to be a home-built invention so it can show off that France is the best in the world. So they steal some tricks from Italy and according to the legend, this does not go unnoticed by the Council of Ten. In fact, a whole bunch of assassins are sent to poison these guys, but it does not work. The secret gets out, and the Palace of Versailles is built on the backs of French glass masters, who take the secrets that they learn from the Murano masters, and they expand them, because they know how to make flat glass using a cast. And so suddenly you've got these giant Murano mirrors that are spectacularly milked and shiny and gorgeous and expensive, and they're made in France so they can go into the Palace of Versailles. So this bold statement is not, hey look, we can make a Venetian mirror. It's, hey look, we can make 357 bigger, shinier, more beautiful mirrors. Take that. <laughs> and so, I would like to just acknowledge that it is big and beautiful and spectacular and like the biggest bedazzled spectacle of the era, but every Italian going to see this 
saw a different message. <laughs> so I'm going to declare myself for House Venice, <laughs> Team Italy, and raise a glass to all those craftsmen who actually did the figuring out for how to make these. Take my tin foil. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Casey. That was fabulous. All right. Now, some of you have noticed we have a little mascot named Harvey Wolpertinger. And we have a little tradition called Adventure Harvey. Uh, we have been building a map that shows all the places that, pe that our community has taken Harvey Wolpertinger, and uh, you can get your own at the, at the merch table. And uh, a reminder, if you go traveling with your Adventure Harvey, please tag them, hashtag Adventure Harvey. If it's a Facebook post, please set it to public, uh, or if you put it on Instagram or other social media, please hashtag Adventure Harvey so that we can add it to our map. So thanks to the efforts of our fellow Barbara North, she's at the merch t table, talk to her about maps. Uh, we have this amazing map with all of these, uh, well, most of the places that people have been taking Harvey Wolpertinger. So again, if you want to be added to the collection, please hashtag Adventure Harvey, uh, or, or, uh, and, and also tell us the location, because if you post a beautiful picture and say Harvey at the beach, we don't know which beach, there's lots of beaches. So furnish us your location, because we love to see where Harvey goes. So in the last month, Harvey has had several adventures. Uh, there have been Harvey's in Costa Rica learning how to make chocolate. Married Harvey's. Harvey has been to San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. Harvey has visited monuments in Cambodia. Uh, taking a little me time in uh, Japanese spas. So if you would like to participate in the Adventure Harvey uh, spectacle, please visit our merch table. I think we only have one harmless Wolper Blinger left, the pageant Wolpertinger. Uh, I make these, a lot of love goes into them, so uh, please adopt one. Also, uh, during intermission, you will find various merch, glassware, uh, buttons, things that help keep us doing what we're doing, and also, you can adopt Harvey. Uh, so during the intermission, if you haven't turned in a raffle slip already, please turn one in at the merch table. We will do a drawing after intermission to, uh, to find who will be going home with this lucky, blingy Wolpertinger. So when we come back, we'll have three more stories, a sinister look into American novelties, uh, the amazing and beautiful and seductive Sally Rand, and uh, um, a baffling geometric conceptual dance ballet. So uh, make sure you enter, and we are going into cocktail time, so please refresh your drink, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 